most highly improbable. Or rather, I agree that both Milton and Kofinkart point to it in that sense acknowledge Coelho, but to speak of Coelho's isolation seems forced and unpersuasive. His importance in the picture is incontrovertible. And above all, the attempt to rationalize the painting's seeming arbitrariness and unintelligibility in this literalist manner ignores the fact that these are basic features of Manet's art from first to last. To which one should add that the historicist considerations concerning national schools, Frenchness, and universality that I began by summarizing can't be imagined to have been readily comprehensible to contemporary viewers as they plainly were not. In other words, we have in Manet a fascinating case of a painter not only ambitious for public success, but seemingly often inclined to think that he was on the verge of achieving it. Um, whose public attitude was always one of claiming to offer sincere paintings of no extraneous complexity, nevertheless producing work after work that roughly 150 years after they were made continued largely to baffle and perplex the most committed and sympathetic viewers. Can this be said of any comparable body of painting in all of modern art? Four, as Castagnari's remark suggests, one factor in his frustration with the luncheon concerns the fact that the young man faces out of the painting. Castagnari, Castagnari writes that the young man looks out at the public, but in fact he doesn't quite, right? Although he stands with his body facing the viewer, his head, as already mentioned, turns slightly to his left, and his gaze drifts off in that direction. Instead, it's the maid, loosely brushed and further back in space, who looks directly at the viewer. In Manet's modernism, I developed the notion that I call facingness. Facingness is a key to Manet's art, as well as to the difficulty it presented to its initial public. And I want to say more about that here. First, though, it's necessary for me to allude uh, to the overarching problematic of beholding that I've argued in a trilogy of books mentioned earlier, Absorption in Theatricality, Courbet's realism and in Manet's modernism, I've argued that this problematic first arose in France in the middle of the 18th century when the presence of the beholder before the painting, or as I also phrased it, the primordial convention that paintings are made to be beheld, emerged as a fundamental problem for the art of painting as never before. Simply put, around that time, Viewers, like the philosoph and pioneer art critic Denis Virevaux, came to feel that to the extent that figures in a painting appeared to be acting in a manner that evinced an awareness of being beheld, those actions came across as false, as manner, in short, as theatrical. Theatrical. And the aesthetic strategy that was developed as a means of obviating this danger of overcoming it, was to seek to depict figures completely absorbed in what they were doing, feeling, and thinking. And because they were so absorbed, therefore wholly unaware of everything else, crucially including the viewer standing before the painting. Diderot uh, advanced related arguments about the theater. Key figures in this development were Jean-Baptiste Samuel Chardin, an absorptive painter par excellence. You hear I'm showing you this painting so far. The whole point of a painting like this being that the young man blowing the bubble is completely absorbed in this operation. Jean-Baptiste Greuze, who is absorbed if we understand his pictures in their own context. And very importantly, Jacques-Louis David, in whose epical history paintings of the 1780s, um, like the Oath of the Horatii that we're looking at, the absorptive strategy takes on a powerfully dramatic form. And it's with a painting like the, like the uh, Oath of the Ratio that modern painting, in a certain sense in France, really gets underway. But we have already this prehistory of dealing with the problem of the viewer. I also argue that the strategy in question of absorbing the figures in the painting kept finding itself undone. That is, the very means that seemed to work at a given moment were viewed as insufficient or worse with the passage of time. 
So, for example, David himself, by the 1790s, came to regard the composition of the Oath of the Horatii, which he painted in 1784, and appeared in the Salon in 1785. By the 90s, we know that he came to find the composition a bit theatrical, a bit theatrical, which led him to paint the less dramatically urgent and expressive <laughs> composition of the intervention of the Serbat Sabines, which he completed in 1799. And here I want you simply to concentrate on the three major figures. Uh, Romulus at the right, um, his wife, Hercilia in the second, in, in the middle, and Tatius, the leader of the Sabines at the left, and the, the, what the relations among those figures. For him, this backed away from the too extreme physicality as it had come to seem to him of the Horatio. But within a relatively short span of years, the Sabines itself came to be seen as theatrical, not in the sense of exaggerated or overdone or overdramatic, so to speak, but in the opposite sense of depicting figures who seemed merely to be holding static poses. And the crisis of the David school in the teens and twenties of the 19th century, as registered, for example, in Stendhal's art criticism, can be understood largely in those terms. In Theodore Jericho, one of the great figures in European Romanticism, we find an attempt to overcome the theatricalization of action expression by main force, as if the evocation of extremes of sheerly physical energy and effort could somehow break through to a new purity of body and soul. The depiction of animals, mainly horses, played a role in this, while on his most ambitious canvas, the stupendous raft of the Medusa, almost all the figures on the raft take part in a collective attempt to attract the attention of, to be beheld by, a tiny, all but undetectable ship on the farthest horizon. And you can barely make it out. There's a tiny ship back there. <coughs> it's actually the ship that much later in the day will rescue them. A tiny, all but undetectable ship on the farthest horizon, as if to be rescued from the beholder standing before the painting, from being beheld by us, in other words, as if their, their effort is to be seen by this ship so that this ship will rescue them. Rescue them from what? from us, from being beheld by us. That's why it's so far back there. And in the art of the great realist painter Gustave <coughs> Courbet, the quintessential realist of the 19th century, there can be seen a different but related strategy, which I describe as a hyperbolic attempt to, to paint himself all but corporeally, all but literally into his paintings, a strategy which, of course, could not literally succeed, which is why I call it hyperbolic, but which nevertheless, by a pictorial dynamic that we've yet fully to understand, gave rise to a series of immensely ambitious paintings of the highest power and originality. We're looking at the Stonebreakers of 1849, actually a painting that was destroyed in the course of the Second World War, and the claim I would want to make uh, would be that the, the the boy, whom we see largely from the rear, holding that basket of stones, is something like, not just a, a, a sign for, or a symbol of, but almost a version of Courbet's own left hand holding his palette, and the older man with the hammer being a version of Courbet's right hand painting the painting. So he's painting himself. It's, in that sense, it's a painting that is a kind of self-portrait of him in the act of painting, but transmuted into this realist form. We come then to that required an entire book called Corbet's Realism. <laughs> I don't expect this instantly uh, inspires total conviction on the part of anyone encountering this thought for the first time. We come then to Manny's generation, called by me the generation of 1863 after the moment of its maximum visibility as a generation at the Salon des Refusés of that year, and including Henri Fantin Latour, Alphonse Le Gros, and James McNeil Whistler during his early years in France. This is not the place to attempt to summarize their collective situation, 
which is analyzed in depth in Manius Modernism. But what we find when we look at their art and the early criticism it provoked is that absorption, what I've been calling absorption in its traditional forms, was no longer sufficient to produce the desired anti-theatrical effect. And that all four artists sought other or additional means of simultaneously acknowledging and bracketing the presence of the beholder. The major artists of that moment, who continued to rely on absorptive themes and motifs, were Jean-Francois Millet in his peasant paintings. So it isn't surprising to find Castagnari in the same salon that I quoted earlier, the salon of 1869, praising Millet's knitting lesson by stating, so this is Castagnari on Millet, it would be difficult to write a thought with greater precision, vigor, and harmony. Nothing is forgotten, and there isn't a single feature that doesn't contribute to the expression. As soon as you look, the author's intention is entirely revealed to you. End of quotation. A radical intelligibility effect, in other words, which puts Mille at the farthest extreme from Manet, though it's also important to note that contemporary assessments of Mille's art were drastically split. For a critic like Castagnari, in 1869, he was a master. But for many other critics, including, including viewers as acute as Théophile Gautier and Charles Baudelaire, his peasant figures were only pretending to be absorbed in their simple tasks, which made them particularly objectionable on anti-theatrical grounds. I take this to mean that absorption as such, in a kind of classic form, as we find it in Mille, no longer functioned as it formerly did, which is not to say that it simply disappeared from advanced painting in France, but it could no longer be relied upon to close the painting to the beholder, as was once the case. Manet's response to the new situation, we may call it a kind of crisis of absorption, or of anti-theatricality, <coughs> was nothing if not radical. As I wrote in Courbet's Realism, it is as though Manet, in his paintings of the first half of the 1860s, <coughs> recognized the ever greater difficulty, verging by the 1850s on impossibility, of effectively negating or neutralizing the primordial convention in paintings of the of the hell. <coughs> and as though he recognized, too, it was therefore necessary to establish the beholder's presence abstractly, <coughs> to build into the painting the separateness, distancedness, the mutual facing that had always characterized the painting beholder relationship in its traditional, unreconstructed form, in order that the worst consequences of the theatricalization of that relationship be averted. Such a reading identifies Manning's enterprise as simultaneously anti-theatrical, anti-theatrical, and vice versa, which also means as not exactly one or the other. Thus, Manning's paintings of the first half of the 1860s repudiate the anecdotally theatrical pictures, often costume pieces, set in earlier centuries that enjoyed great popularity at the salons of the 1850s and 60s. <coughs> But they do so by exploiting a strictly presentational, as opposed to actual, mode of theatricality. The chief historical source and sanction for which was Vato, and the principal function of which, in Manu's art, was to make newly perspicuous in effect to force on the beholder's attention certain truths about the painting beholder relationship it was no longer possible to deny. It's also at least arguable that one effect of Manet's strategy, and doubtless also a principal cause of the extreme provocation that his paintings typically <laughs> offer to contemporary audiences, is that the beholder, the actual beholder, sensed that he or she had been made supererogatory to a situation that ostensibly demanded his or her presence, as if his or her place before the painting were already occupied by virtue of the extreme measures that had been taken to stake it out. In sum, Manet sought to acknowledge, not negate or neutralize the presence of the beholder. That act of acknowledgement holds the key to Manet's painting's notorious flatness. 
as though what has always been taken as a, de a declaration of flatness is more importantly the product of an attempt to make the painting in its entirety, the painting as a painting, that is, as a tableau, face the beholder as never before. That's what I'm heading for. Quality of facing the viewer. Again, there's more to be said on and around the topic. For example, in all Manning's multi-figure works, no more than a single personage ever looks directly out of the painting. And the reason for this, I've suggested, is that by restricting himself in this way, Manet was able to minimize the sense of psychological connection with the various figures a given work comprised, thereby displacing the beholder's attention away from the individual personages to the painting as a whole. Also in Manet's modernism, basing myself on the art sources of the period, I emphasize Manet's consistent pursuit of what I call strikingness, the idea being that the combination of facingness with a certain striking power at a distance, a kind of hyper-perspicuousness based in part on the clarity of enclosing contours and the starkness of light-dark contrast, gave and indeed still gives his canvases an emphatic, not to say aggressive, presence on the gallery wall. And you remember that Castagnari spoke of the luncheon and the studio as striking the eyes. Viewed in this context, the single figures paintings of 1865-67, for all their brilliance, reveal certain limitations, um, which in some ways become most acute uh, if one looks at paintings called the beggar philosophers, uh, where we have a beggar philosopher based on Velasquez seeming to uh, hold his hand out to the viewer, which seems like one of Manny's few bad ideas. <laughs> the return to the multi-figure format after his one-man exhibition of 1867 thus has the character of a decided recovery of pictorial energy. Manet is himself again back on track, is what one feels. Five. In the old musician, Desjardins sur la and Olympia, the principal figure in each canvas gazes directly, forcefully at the beholder. In the Munich luncheon, however, the beholder addressing role is played by a secondary figure, the somewhat distanced maid in her gray dress and white cap, while the young man in the extreme foreground gazes off canvas to his left, our uh, right. In fact, the maid wasn't originally part of the composition. X-rays show first that the room in which the scene was staged was in fact the studio, with glazing instead of the back wall, and second, that the maid had yet to be inserted into the rather large space between the flower pot and rubber plant and the young man. My sense is that her addition proved crucial, both as providing a link between the plant in the left part of the painting generally and the young man in the right part of the painting, and as introducing a note of direct address and overt facingness that sets off, in effect, draws attention to the slight but crucial obliquity of the young man's gaze. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. In the balcony, we've gone immediately afterward. The most compelling by far of the three figures, the Spanish seeming Bert Morriso at the left, gazes off to her right, our left, the standing Antoine Guillemet around a stiff character in a high collar, blue necktie, and expansive shirt front, looks before him to our right, and it's just possible that the third figure, Fanny Price, is looking out of the picture, but her gaze has been so blurred, partly as a result of giving her a Japanese air, that she scarcely seems to be addressing anyone. She holds a furled umbrella, she's fiddling with a glove, almost as if she's ready to leave the painting. In other words, both paintings move away from a sheerly confrontational format of the early multi-figure works, suggesting that Manny now had other, different ends in view. Nevertheless, both produce a powerful effect of facingness. The balcony largely on the strength of its principal motif, the ironwork balcony itself, with its schematic, rectilinear, acid, green railing and shutters, <coughs> along with the contrast, striking to say the least, between the two women in white and the dark interior. And the luncheon, by virtue of its total organization, which requires further analysis. Note to begin with the strongly frontal, overwhelmingly lateral organization of the composition. 
Not only is the table covered by a white tablecloth parallel to the picture plane, also parallel to that plane is the wall behind it with its rectilinear windows at the upper left and hanging scroll in the upper right sector of canvas. Then there's the fact that the standing European saw at the lower left appears virtually to be supported by the left hand and bottom framing edges of the canvas. It just seems to be held up by the canvas itself. I can think of no other work in which Manny does anything like this. The helmet is shown in profile, which of course means that it too is keyed to the picture plane. The decorated white porcelain flower pot and rubber plant with large green leaves seem, if not quite to face the beholder, at any rate to be frontally exposed to his, her gaze. Then there's the maid holding a silver coffee pot, the spout pointing towards the young man, and looking at the beholder with no particular expression on her sketchily executed face. Toward the bottom of the canvas, silhouetted against the maid's dress is the black cat cleaning itself mentioned earlier. And finally, in the right hand half of the composition are juxtaposed the standing, snub-nosed, blue-eyed young man in his cream trousers, black jacket, and straw hat, the still life on the white tablecloth, and the older man with dark whiskers and a top hat seated on the other side of the table who is shown exhaling smoke from a cigarette, a marvelously evocative effect. 